some net. We have the net in, 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 in Lombardia, which is called Respiranet, brief if you want in English. And uh, that, that was created for H1 and one outbreak and is uh, essentially an ECMO net. There are five big hospitals. One of, the, one of these is uh, Bergamo, that usually offer mobile ECMO for a very, very sick patient. And we use that net to do the skeleton of the big net in, in Lombardia. Then there, we create a, a national net, an international net, a transfer patient who cannot be allocated inside the hospital and the field hospital which was created in Bergamo. And the other thing is areas. You not you have not to mix up the the patients. Uh, of course, in the middle of the outbreak, most of the patients are COVID, but you are not to infect patients who come in the hospital. So you have to have two pathways, even for war and intensive care, and then you have to forecast gray zone because you have to have also the possibility to isolate patients singularly when you establish if they are gray or black or white, positive or negative. And it takes hours. When you are in the middle of an outbreak, your, your lab explodes of salt. So <clears throat> you might need to wait for 12 to 48 hours to add the, the answer. So uh, the, your gray zone has to be big at some point. Equipment, as I told you before, is crucial. Ventilators are crucial. You cannot ventilate a patient by hand. This, this patient needs uh, PEEP. So uh, you cannot provide PEEP by hand. Okay, so you, you need ventilators. If you don't have ventilators, you, you are in a big problem. And we, we, uh, we, we are in a position in which we, we reconvert also OR to, uh, to ventilate patients. We use OR ventilators to, to ventilate patients. Plus of that, uh, drugs and simple things as heparin, sedation, steroids, also blood gas syringe can be, become a, a big problem because you, you, your pharmacist will struggle to find out how to supply you in, in, in this kind of um, hell you, 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 you fall in. So, Reorganization is, is crucial because you cannot say, okay, there is a pandemia, but I carry on with my own practice. No, we reconvert everyone to, uh, to COVID practice. Uh, you need someone that is empowered to be um, in the position to, to reorganize the hospital from, to, from a day to another. Every day we, we do a, essentially a meeting in which we say, we need this amount of beds, uh, this equipment, and we try to find out and sort out the problem. Otherwise, you, you cannot remain on the top of the problem. At some point, you, we, we were in, a, in the position to admit 500, 550 patients COVID, plus the, the others coming in a and &E. In the peak, we admit in, in a and &E 100 respiratory patients in the morning. So we, we, we were overwhelmed. And the other thing is protect your staff. Staff is vital, is the most precious thing you, you have in your bed because if you start to have a lot of sickness in your, in your staff, you, you're gonna close your hospital. So what we have done is doing um, a refresher training for PPE. Uh, every, uh, every nurse shift uh, outside intensive care <coughs> just to simulate the station and train them to, to use correctly uh, this PPE. With this um, essentially training, we limit the amount of, pay, uh, of people uh, fall sick during this outbreak. Uh, it's less than 10%. Plus, you have to consider your intensive care will become very crowded. Um, we essentially reconvert all the four intensive care apart of eight beds in COVID, uh, in COVID beds. So we open up six intensive care 
for COVID. <clears throat> so, but you, you have to be very schematic and you have to establish a, a kind of um, transversal protocol to treat these patients. As soon as you learn what you have to do with this patient. Um, few words, when you are a, a, a big hospital, um, you might need to, to, to provide, you used to provide ECMO. You used to provide ECMO and uh, uh, is, uh, is a shame you cannot provide ECMO to everyone you want to provide it. And you had to be very, very strict and you had to see if you can provide ECMO in this uh, kind of problems. Why then? Because it is very, very, um, it's very, very difficult to provide ECMO in a scarcity resources. And uh, also, also uh, give us a guidance. You can see, you can go from a conventional capacity to a crisis, crisis capacity, in which you cannot provide ECMO if you are um, in the position, I don't know what is going on my screen. Um, in the position to allocate resources on um, on ECMO. So if you have to provide ECMO, you need nurses and doctors to look after them. So you have to graduate your action essentially on the amount of patients you have got. This is what happened in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. You can see we start uh, even before the 21st of March to provide ECMO, but we try to allocate ECMO on the ultra young patient who, who might recover from this pathology. And now, <clears throat> the 25th of February, we are near to 1,000 run in all Europe. You can see the map. <clears throat> This is a brief example of what we can do with that mom. Uh, we cannulate a patient with was uh, after pregnancy. She she was admitted for a respiratory failure and uh, she was pregnant. Uh, we perform we don't perform anything because we uh, she was in a peripheral hospital. They perform a, a, a C section for fatal deceleration and uh, after two days. We went there to collect her because she was very sick and she saturated 75% and 100% of oxygen. So we transferred to our hospital and we keep her here with ECMO for 13 days. So you see 13 days only for ECMO. So the admission in intensive care was nearly 80, 18 days uh, in intensive care. Uh, and she was weaned out and she was uh, discharged from from the unit in, in a proper shape, but was was really challenging in, in the moment in which the, the, the outbreak was climbing and we struggled to allocate patient on the ventilator. So you have to be very careful. If you have a patient with a 50% of mortality, you have not to forget, you have lots of patients that they might have 10% mortality if you put on a ventilator. So you have to choose. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Lorenzo, for that uh, wonderful talk uh, from Bergamo. And, uh, now we're going to move to um, our next presentation, who is uh, the speaker, another great speaker, is Lorenzo uh, Galetti, who is the Chief of Cardiac Surgery and Bambino de Gesù in Rome. And, the nurse um, from BAD and heart failure coordinator, uh, Daniele Selvaggio. So go ahead, uh, Lorenzo. Daniele, could you put the, the kind of the presentation, please? So looks like everyone is uh, Lorenzo in Italy, no? Lorenzo yeah. Grazioli, Lorenzo Galletti, many Lorenzo. I just would in introduce briefly the, uh, the topics, I, I would tell that we are uh, really lucky because uh, we have, did not have uh, until now 
an outbreak like in the north of Italy. Maybe because of our particular situation, our hospital. Next one is the Bambino Gesù Hospital. It's not it's, um, a children's hospital, but it's not only an hospital. Five, actually, there, is, there are uh, five different hospitals. The principal one is, uh, could you, is the, um, where the high intensity care is, where actually I am in uh, Gianicolo, close to the Vatican. There is two hospitals for outpatients, and there is an, another two hospitals, a little uh, far, for 30 kilometers, more or less, from the center of Rome. Next one. Next one, Daniele, please. Uh, this is our, uh, our department, is a Department of Medical and Surgical Pediatric Cardiology. Uh, as I, I said before, there is four different locations. We run on seven clinical units, pediatric cardiology, arrhythmia, international cardiologist, coach unit, heart surgery unit, heart failure, and we have also sport medicine unit. Our activity is over 57 beds and five different uh, operating rooms. On the right the side of the slides, you can, you can see our number, uh, around uh, 1,800 uh, hospitalization per year, so 5,500 5, uh, uh, day hospital, 70, uh, 75,000 uh, outpatient services, 600 surgical procedure, 450 of cardiopulmonary bypass, and 700 cardiopulmonary Go ahead, please, Daniele. We have a huge program of uh, mechanical device and transplantation, and we have experience uh, with almost all the devices that have been used in uh, children and adolescents. And uh, uh, we have also there is a respirator also in uh, the south of Italy, like uh, uh, Lorenzo was telling before. Next one. Next one, Daniele, please. But maybe uh, we are not. Uh, go to the previous one, please. But maybe this. No, no, that's it. Go ahead. Just uh, to show the Vatican, this may be the reason for what uh, we have uh, uh, until now. Luckily, as you see, our hospital is really. 300 meters from the St. Peter Square. So we have a special benediction of our uh, activity. So now, Daniele, uh, we show you uh, how we uh, run our protocol. And uh, uh, we started with, consideration, with some consideration from different cases that uh, arrived to our observation. Please, Daniele. The mic, the, you have to open the microphone, Daniele. Okay, do you, do you hear my voice? Okay, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Galetti. I will introduce you uh, our starting point about the case of the little Ginevra patient that we're gonna uh, take from Bergamo, bring into our hospital in Rome. Uh, we are very interesting from, uh, for protecting the department from the pandemic event, but uh, we want to give a mutual assistance with the Italian cardiac and surgery centers. Uh, the methodology which we dealt uh, with taking in charge of the patient from a red zone started to draft the operating protocol. The patient, she is a three years old patient with a several heart failure by a um, cardiomyopathy. She's accepted by the emergency department um, and she, um, give, she take a COVID-19 swab test. Pending the outcome of the swab, the patient in a stay in a single carry in isolated room wearing a surgical mask and adopting measuring of social distancing. After the negative outcome of the swab, the patient is transferred to a semi-intensive uh, pediatric area where she is monitoring by the medical team for heart failure. 
The patient can hold all the diagnostic tests in the same intensive area isolation, and after the second negative test, after seven days, she transferred by the, uh, to the cardiology department to continue the diagnostic process. A final test, COVID, is repeated 14 days after the first WAPS <laughs> and declared us that the patient is definitely not affected by COVID-19. At the moment, in all locations, the screening for the patient and the family is based on uh, body temperature and the patient and companion questionnaire. All the patient is on the road to surgery must do the swap for COVID-19. Is not allowed the presence of more than one uh, family member, and at the moment the companion protocol for the operating section for the family member has been suspended. All the patients that arrive in an hospital in and um, by the day hospital must perform this action, must wear the surgical mask. The patient and the caregiver must be placed away from the other patient and keeping the distance at, at least one meter. Healthcare workers providing assistance must adopt personal protective equipment based on the activity carried out. If the patient arrives on the first height of the emergency department, If uh, the patient doesn't have respiratory symptoms, through the usual pet, triage, first state and a waiting room, accompanied by just one person. The patient must use their surgical mask and adopt the normal rules of social dis uh, distancing. If the patient has uh, respiratory symptoms, Access by the pre-trials in a tent, one at a time, accompanied by just one person. Both the patient and the companion were masked and carry out the hand hygiene. Our SARS-CoV-2 OPBB center is located in the location of Palidoro, the location near the sea that Dr. Galletti just introduced before. It's both for the ordinary and the critical and the critical hospitalization. This is a schedule where um, we monitoring every morning the body temperature. So you can see we're going to write if the temperature is higher than 37.5. We put the signature of the person that detects your temperature, a working hours, professional qualifications, and the name and surname. This is how we mm, manage the personal product equipment. We use the recommendation by the OMS. So as you can see, you know, patient room ward, people uh, are uh, differentiated by healthcare workers, healthcare workers, cleaners, and visitors. In this moment in the hospital, the visitor is allowed is just one. We have different, the most important difference between the two sections is that the The patient can be in absence of aerosol generating or with the aerosol generating, uh, um, generating procedure at frequent place. This is our policies of management of our resource because we had some problems with the use PPA appropriately and coordinate the PPA supply chain. And this is how the patient come in our departments. If the person, if the, the child is, is living in Lazio region, he gonna perform the swap at the Roma San Paolo department. If it's from another region, he performed the rapid swap directly in the MCCP, our department of cardiology, the morning of the hospitalization. If the patient came from uh, Sorry, from emergency, the patient will be stabilization in emergency room and the execution of a ra rapid swap test. If the rapid swap test is negative, it's gonna go to admission to our intensive care unit, cardiac. If the positive rapid test is positive, we're gonna value if the patient needs ECMO. If it needs the ECMO, 
the surgery is gonna uh, make the admission in the emergency department. If he doesn't need, if he doesn't need ECMO, maybe the patient gonna need the surgery. If they don't need the surgery, the patient is gonna go to the admission to the pediatric semi intensive area with the nursing and medical staff of our department. If the patient needs in the same day the surgery, is gonna operate in another pavilion far from our pavilion, and then it's gonna admission in the emergency department. Thank you. Daniele, thank you so much again. Uh, this is uh, amazing presentation. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, strong presentation from our friends from Italy. Um, now we're moving forward, and uh, it's interesting. Um, I got a thanks God was I was awake yesterday about like five a.m. and uh, I got this uh, notification from Alan Fraze from UK that over the last three weeks there has been uh, apparently increase of number of children with, of all ages presented with a multi-system inflammatory state requiring intensive care unit across London and other regions of UK. Uh, I think, uh, oh, you go first, that, that's fine, Alan. Uh, I think I had uh, Joanne on the other, but that's fine, you can go ahead. And uh, so then um, I think it's very important for us as cardiologists, pediatric cardiologists and intensive care, just to learn about this new presentation of uh, this uh, disease. Um, we're learning every day. Go ahead, uh, Alain. Alain is the chief of pediatric cardiology uh, the Royal uh, Brunton, uh, good friend for many years, we, uh, we were fellows together, but go ahead, uh, Alain. Great pleasure to manage with us. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so this is a uh, uh, brand, brand new uh, uh, disease that uh, is affecting uh, many countries in Europe. And uh, it's, it's too early really to describe um, how, how is it uh, um, I mean, what, what is be the scope of this uh, disease? It, it's basically a multi-system inflammatory syndrome with cardiac involvement, and, and it's most likely related to COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this data are not really my data, and I'm very grateful to all the people you can see uh, on this slide uh, who helped me to uh, present, to, to set up this, this, this short presentation. And uh, um, uh, from UK many, but also from France with uh, Damien Bonnet, uh, who raised the alert uh, in France uh, yesterday uh, evening. Um, I want, yeah, so basically what we know from uh, the epidemiology data, in UK we have at least uh, 30 cases, and uh, one, one patient is currently on ECMO, and two, pa two patients died. Um, I, um, I, I know that in Spain there have been at least 15 patients in PSU between Madrid and Barcelona. I think our colleague may um, comment much more accurately on this. And Italy is also uh, quite, uh, quite affected. I mean, uh, um, uh, at least uh, uh, from, from our, we have uh, uh, two Italian consultants and also one of our uh, uh, previous consultant in Padova, so this is the information I have had. Uh, let me uh, uh, go to the next slide. So, uh, the French data has been provided yesterday by, by Damien Baudet uh, from Necker, and they had uh, 28 cases, most of the cases presented last week. Uh, the patients, are most of them, over five years, uh, the admission uh, were uh, obviously uh, uh, it was quite a big volume of patients uh, uh, last week in their PICU. Or almost at the time they were considering restarting a normal uh, uh, activity, and uh, this patient had um, sort of Kawasaki or myocarditis presentation uh, with a strong uh, inflammatory uh, syndrome. Uh, they had uh, left ventricular dysfunction, uh, most of them, and they some some more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, 
satellite presentation like uh, Takotsubo-like. Um, interestingly, some patients had coronary artery dilatation and uh, uh, no true aneurysm. Uh, troponin was almost always elevated, but not very high. And uh, um, in CG, there were no specific anomalies, but importantly, in, uh, on, on, on the blood, there was a very important uh, inflammation syndrome. Um, COVID status was positive in one third of the patients. Uh, and most of the patients uh, uh, necessitated hydrotropic support. Obviously, this is a, a very selective group of patients uh, who were admitted uh, uh, in, uh, in PICU, most of them. And 13 of them were in Paris, uh, the rest were in other part of France. Um, the outcome was favorable, uh, but uh, one patient had to go on ECMO. Um, However, there, was, uh, there were no deaths. 90% uh, of the patients responded well to IVIG. Um, I uh, just should also mention, if you can just go back to the previous slide, uh, Ricardo, please, uh, just should mention about very few data about the uh, about UK. Um, they, we, we, we have uh, uh, around 29 cases uh, around uh, London. It's difficult really to state uh, if they are really linked to COVID because uh, we, we don't have uh, a positive uh, serology for uh, uh, most of them, just like uh, uh, the, the French uh, uh, presentation. Um, not all of them have evidence of left ventricular dysfunction, but uh, the majority of them presented some uh, kind of uh, inflammatory shock. And uh, they were also treated with uh, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, therapy. And uh, I think that, that's, that's about it. About important information is about ethnicity. Uh, in both uh, groups, there was... Uh, um, quite important amount of patients uh, uh, from um, North Africa or uh, Black Africa. So, um, uh, not, not so much, a few Asiatic <laughs> patients as well. Um, the youngest patient uh, in UK was 11 months. Next, uh, maybe next slide. So, wh 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 what we can say from now, uh, we've sent an alert uh, in all our local hospitals and uh, as you can see, it's, it's really a um, non-specific clinical picture. They have persistent fever, they have high inflammatory syndrome, syndrome, they have high troponin. And for us, this criteria of high troponin is quite important. It's a, uh, it, it will basically uh, be a non-specific diagnosis criteria, but it will help us to create the patient who need to be admitted uh, in, um, and monitored. Uh, because patients with normal troponin, we can probably follow them in local hospital. Patients with high troponin, we need to bring them in a tertiary center. Um, uh, the, as I said, the ECG is uh, non-specific. Uh, echo will show pictures of myocarditis. Coronary artery dilatation, uh, not only in France, but in few patients in UK as well. And these patients, they have often a picture of um, uh, abdominal pain. Uh, liver function tests are often abnormal. There was one patient with high HDLAS as well. So uh, this patient needs to have abdominal ultrasound. And um, especially the Evelyn Hospital is investigating the use of CT scan uh, in this uh, patient population. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, so. Again, uh, you have a branch of uh, investigation. You have, uh, uh, this is what we are doing as a protocol, uh, preliminary protocol for now. And this is really ongoing uh, information. That means tomorrow uh, we hope to have uh, uh, more accurate uh, data and uh, hopefully to provide uh, um, an, an up-to-date uh, uh, document that might be more useful than what we have now. But all these data uh, are, are basically from today. Uh, what, he, what we want to state is any patient with this type of uh, um, inflammatory syndrome, um, uh, myocarditis, Kawasaki-like, uh, what we recommend is really to monitor uh, troponin. And uh, any patient with right troponin should be admitted and monitored to a tertiary center with uh, 
access to critical care. I mean, that's basically what, what I can state uh, uh, today. Um, and again, this is information. I'm very grateful to my uh, colleague who provided all this between yesterday uh, evening and, and today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your, your time and you know, teaching us about the course of this uh, new presentation. Now we're moving to Spain, Barcelona. Uh, Joan Sanchez, uh, are you there, Joan? Perfect. Uh, thank you, Joan. You see, Joan is the, uh, he's a pediatric cardiologist and uh, intensive care physician. He's the chief of cardiology of Children's Hospital in Barcelona, Hospital San Juan de Deu. And Joan, great. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us your experience of this. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ricardo, again for the invitation. Uh, let me start by a thank you all, and it's a real privilege to be here with people all around the world and many friends sharing our experience. Uh, I changed a little bit the slides because uh, uh, some of the things that we've uh, said before. Uh, I'm going to just give two slides about our single experience uh, very briefly because uh, the, many, uh, the majority of the things have been said before. So let me let me share a couple of uh, things. So sorry, the slides are not advancing well, so I will change like this. Can you guys see my slides like this? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, as you all know, Barcelona is now uh, and Spain is now in the center of the, the map of this pandemia. And that, that those have been unfortunate news. Uh, many of you knew Spain and Italy for other important reasons such as the tourism now, we are all known um, by being in the center of this pandemic. The good news, as they said, is that we are uh, over the, um, the curve and uh, things start to being a little bit better. And the other important thing uh, in, in this pandemic, and the, the, the positive thing is that kids have been preserved, right? And we have had no severe cases until now of the, uh, severe kids being admitted in the ICU. And the, the distribution of uh, this pandemic is grossly a um, focus to the to the elder uh, to the elder elderly population. One of the things that I wanted to uh, to point out is uh, what happened here in Barcelona, in particularly in, in our center. San Juan de Deu is a, one of the main pediatric centers in, in Spain and in, in Southern Europe. And uh, we have a, a privileged location within the city. And for all of you that know Barcelona, the, the center is located outside the city. And that gave us a little bit of a, a reassuring position within this pandemia to secure the kids outside of the of the search. Uh, Barcelona's Children's Hospital has a uh, important pediatric cancer center, the heart center and small maternity. So we thought that it was a, a good location to, to, to keep the, the pediatric population a, in, 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 good, in, in a good state of health. So we, we, uh, we try to centralize all the pediatric cases and the maternity in our hospital protect our staff and the pediatric population and dedicate a small area of COVID-19 within the hospital. Uh, the same thing that, that others did uh, in terms of the pediatric cardiology, we did a team segregation, rapid implementation of protocols, we cancel all the activity, we, can't, we cancel routine outpatient clinic visits, we implemented telemedicine, telemedicine we reinforced it in and out of the hospital remote monitoring, and we offer the expertise, the expertise of our team to the adult hospitals, right? But uh, approximately one week on the the, the pandemia, we we were realizing that we didn't have many patients admitted to the hospital, so we ended up with 15 ventilators a. Uh, um, in the ICU, uh, and uh, the decision was made to open the hospital to young adults. And that changed a little bit our practice, right? And uh, as a pediatric cardiology, our activity uh, changed gears to the uh, adult world. Uh, we were living relatively well because we were doing remote a uh, monitoring of the ECG and a relatively strict protocol and restrictive protocol of echocardiography. A remoting, a controlling our thing, uh, our uh, monitors from our computers. 
but then a couple of uh, a, um, news uh, arise, and uh, we saw this a, a graph a, an, in some of the, the papers, and we were thinking whether a, a second search of uh, a second search of uh, um, the disease will affect our kids. And this is probably what, what we are seeing right now and what Elaine was talking about and what I want to share with you. Now, a, uh, in the, within the last two weeks, exactly within the last 12 days, and I, I'm going to talk about the experience in Barcelona. Madrid has a, a similar experience, but what we have seen now here as a referral pediatric center is a big surge of Kawasaki-like syndrome patients. We have in the last 12 days, 10 new uh, Kawasaki uh, patients. Of those 10 patients uh, with a um, Kawasaki specific syndromes, four of them are COVID-19 uh, COVID PCR positive, and two of them that are negative have, have been tested positive for IgG, COVID-19. Those patients have a, uh, a relative different presentation compared to the, the, the other Kawasaki's that we have seen previously. They have massive increases of pro-BNP, normal troponins, and normal systolic function on, on, the, eco, uh, on, uh, on the echocardiography. On the right-hand side, I have plotted uh, the information for those patients in terms of uh, a uh, pro-BNP, uh, CRPs and uh, ferritin, just for you to see what happened on the on on three days spot checks of uh, this uh, uh, labs. So the other thing that we have seen, and I think that Madrid has a little bit more patients of those, is patients with toxic shock syndrome uh, that ended up in the ICU. We only have two patients that have been admitted in, uh, into the ICU into the people with this uh, diagnosis. But the majority of patients are Kawasaki. Please, 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 COVID positive, and this is the aneurysms that you can see and the dilations on the right uh, coronary. And on the right side of the, your image, you can see the patient, the echocardiography from a patient with a toxic uh, uh, shock syndrome that was admitted overnight into the ICU. Two different presentations that could be related to the same disease. Some people have uh, sent alert about Kawasaki. Some others have talked about the toxic shock syndrome. And some of the uh, some of the centers, some of the pediatric centers, have been talking about myocarditis and left ventricular uh, diastolic, uh, left ventricular systolic dysfunction. We don't know exactly how things will turn in the next couple of weeks, but I think that uh, certainly we are in the new uh, phase of this disease. And we should all be alert that something might be um, uh, hitting our pediatric patients. This is the only remark that I wanted to uh, make. So if there is uh, further questions, I will be happy to answer later on. Thank you, Joan. Wow, very, very, very impressive uh, uh, disease. And thanks all for these great presentations. And I'm going to share with everybody. We have every single continent. Even we have uh, Dr. Ed Clue from Africa, from Botswana, from South uh, in Africa too. So we, this has been a great success. We're going to open to questions now. Uh, Lindsay, my co-host, uh, my nurse director from the CSU here at Children's National, please go ahead. Uh, we're open to questions related to uh, these presentations and maybe five minutes, last five minutes, I'm going to ask the question of the way. Go ahead, Lindsay, please. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo. We have several questions so far. So for those of you that have seen Kawasaki's, um, is there a concern or there was initially a concern with NSAIDs? Are you giving aspirin to COVID positive patients? Okay, Joan, do you want to answer the question?
or Alain, are you there? Okay, right. Ricardo, I was I was muted. Okay, okay. Go, ahead. go ahead, John, please. So, uh, I think that, that you were asking for uh, how many positive COVID-19 we have in this in within this Kawasaki population. <laughs> and are you treating with aspirin? Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, all of them have been treated with aspirin. And, and as I mentioned in my presentation, none of the patients have been admitted to the ICU. No ventricular uh, dysfunction on these patients. All treated with, has and with aspirin. And um, we are now a, uh, treating with IVIG. But we had the problem that we didn't have the serologists uh, uh, for all the patients. So now that we have been able to send all the serologists, we are treating with IVIG. Can I ask? Okay, Alan, do you want to give a, a question? A, a answer yeah, too? well, we, 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 we had uh, uh, only a few, uh, few Kawasaki patients. They were mainly treated uh, with, uh, well, Kawasaki like, because we, we, we are not sure at all they are, they are true uh, Kawasaki. Uh, we, we think some of these virus can cause inflammation of the coronaries, uh, which is, uh, and, and one of our concerns, by the way, is uh, what if one of our previous Kawasaki patients we are following with uh, possibly um, dilated coronary arteries uh, catch this type of infection. So uh, we think they might be more vulnerable than others. Otherwise, these patients have been treated uh, you know, symptomatically with uh, uh, IVIG and uh, 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 some um, uh, aspirin as well, I guess. But one important feature we had in UK is all, all the patients, Kawasaki, all this type of patient we have described had positive dedimer, which is quite consistent with COVID uh, infection, even if the serology are negative. Uh, can I ask a question, please? Uh, go ahead, Dr. Mahid. Uh, could you stay for work? Where are you from, please? Um, um, Dr. Majid Jad from UK. Thank you. Pijad Shem from UK. Um, can I ask whether you've been able, either of the centers, been able to develop any um, uh, poor prognostic signs or indicator in any of these cases, like what we do in Kawasaki or incomplete Kawasaki, for example, when they have higher risk for, uh, say, coronary um, arterial complication. In any of these, any poor prognostic indicators, for example, um, have you been able to do that? Uh, Joan, do you want to answer that question too? Mm, yeah, this is a, right, a, a very interesting question. Unfortunately, this is something that just happened over the last 10 days, 12 days, and we are in the phase of collecting all the information. We, we know, as I said, that there is some, a, uh, and as Alain said, we have some lab markers that are uh, a little bit different from the typical Kawasaki. One is the D-dimer, the other one is the ferritin, and the other one is the pro -BNP, which are the three of them higher than what we typically see in the normal Kawasaki or the usual Kawasaki. But it's, again, I think it's too pre premature to to um, take conclusions from all this data. Thank you. Yeah, just one, one of the... So much. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and I'm sure yeah, I, 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 we need to move to another question, please. Sorry. Yeah, just, just one of the questions we are asking uh, ourselves uh, as well is, uh, should we anticoagulate uh, all these patients given uh, uh, the positive dedimer and given the, the, the picture uh, of atypical Kawasaki uh, or myocarditis? Usually, you don't uh, anticoagulate pediatric patients with myocarditis, but in this case, uh, uh, this is different. Thank you. For both of you also, um, were you giving Plaquenil to the patients that ended up with Kawasaki? And then is there any indication that the genotype would be different or any ideas as to why we're just now seeing? Joan, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, again, unfortunately, I don't have uh, much more to add. Uh, this is a recent uh, uh, finding. And there is a lot of things that are missing in the puzzle. So I think that we have to be a, a very, very cautious before just uh, taking conclusions. Yeah, I mean, 
key issue for us really uh, we, we don't have enough information it's it's a last few days information so we just want to bring this uh, uh, issue as a kind of alert because you apparently didn't have any uh, such cases in the US and you're probably going to have other countries in Europe maybe don't have so we just want to to raise this issue uh, for everyone to be aware but for now it's way too early to raise some outcome uh, uh, policy factor etc hopefully uh, we'll use uh, later on this uh, um, this web meeting to update you Thank you. Elaine, how soon after are you seeing onset of symptoms and then presenting with the clinical disease? Um, I mean, the, in UK, we had um, a phase of uh, prodromes of between three and uh, 11 days, basically, before really the patient uh, presented was, uh, was admitted. So uh, many of these patients uh, had some... Uh, uh, around more than one third had some abdominal, atypical abdominal pain. So uh, basically that's what I can say, but it's too early to, uh, you know, this, many of these patients uh, uh, went to PICU, has been uh, uh, in a life-treating situation. So it's, it's a little bit too early to have a, a complete analysis, a retrospective analysis of how early they had um, uh, many so maybe preliminary symptoms. But this is what I can say. The prodromic phase was between 3 and 11 days. Okay. Thank you. I think we have one, one more question. Then I have uh, maybe one or two more questions for question of the week. And So please go ahead, uh, Lindsay, please. One more question. Yes. Are we seeing the same type of phenomenon in uh, Rome? Sorry, I, I was just uh, just uh, typing. For the moment, we didn't see any of this patient uh, with this characteristic in Rome. Uh, someone asked uh, about uh, geno virus genoma. Uh, we don't have information in Italy about uh, this particular ge different genoma in this kind of patient, obviously, because that's really, uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, in Rome, no. In Bergamo, they have some patient that was uh, um, COVID positive, but not with uh, this kind of myocarditis. The information that we have uh, in adult uh, that uh, for the moment the COVID is two subtype, no more in the north of Italy. Thank you, Lorenzo. I think I'm gonna. Uh, we're unfortunately 4:58. That's been a great success. Let me ask a question of the week that we have uh, here uh, is, should emergency surgeries be performed in COVID-19 patients? Let me ask this question to one of our colleagues in uh, Cincinnati. Are you there, David Cooper? Uh, yeah, Ricardo, I'm here. David is the Chief of Cardiac ICU and Cincinnati Children's. David, please. Oh, I love the easy questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, so emergency surgeries absolutely should be performed in COVID-19 patients. Um, you know, if it's an emergency, it's an emergency. So um, there's, uh, I don't know how much you're going to be able to get around doing that. We've done emergency uh, operations in patients with other infections. We've done emergency valve surgery in patients positive for the flu. Um and uh, um, obviously different viruses, uh, but I think if it's an emergency uh, and there's no other contraindication to doing the procedure, we would proceed. Okay, thank you. One more question, the same for question of the week. Uh, do we have Dr. Arboleda? Let's move to outside of the states, other side of the continent. We have uh, in Peru, uh, Miguel, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, it's, it's not there. Well, uh, I think it's 5 uh, p.m. Thank you very much. This, this has been an amazing learning experience for us. It's been a, a tremendous uh, 
meeting and the question of the week, look at that, 88%, they said, yes, we should perform surgeries in COVID-19 patients, okay? Greetings from Washington. I hope to stay healthy, uh, all of you, and uh, really, I, I wish you all the best. I think next week, we're gonna have uh, another very, very good lecture. I don't know yet which one. I'd let you know, it's kind of a surprise in the middle of the week, but I really appreciate all the friends that send me communications about the status of COVID-19 in our pediatric cardiology or cardiac ICU patients, and please do that, and all of us will learn it. Thank you so, so much, everybody, and enjoy your rest of the week. Thank you. So Thanks, Ricardo. Great, uh, great talks today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Thanks. Thank Ciao, Lore. Ciao, Lorenzo. Grazie. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>